Remember him? Jeffrey Epstein. Still did not kill himself. He is still alive. My strong suspicion is, yes, just that, that he is alive and well somewhere. Epstein has been on everybody's lips for quite some time, even though he met his death years ago. However, there has been a growing section of the population that believes the disgraced billionaire is still alive. And now, disturbing footage that supports this theory has surfaced on the internet and may soon go viral. So, is Epstein really alive? Jeffrey Epstein alive? He's still alive anyway, so we can just go to his island. Do you think he's still alive? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah, he's, he's on that island. Internet detectives have been on Jeffrey Epstein's case since news first broke out of his disgusting crimes. And after he was reported dead, they did not rest, as they now seem to have stumbled on yet another conspiracy. According to sections of the internet, Jeffrey Epstein's death was faked. They maintain that he is still alive, and that drone footage taken on the island can confirm this. So which footage is this, and does it really show Jeffrey Epstein alive? picture of Jeffrey Epstein that was found. This is real, folks. This is actually a photograph of him on August 30th. Now, supposedly he died August 10th, but he was er, August 30th. In the weeks after Epstein was pronounced dead, drone footage of his island, Little St. James was posted on a YouTube page called Rusty Shackleford, which has since been taken down from YouTube. The drone footage extensively covered Epstein's island and gave viewers a glimpse of what the island was like. In one of the videos, there were two men on golf carts, and one of them had gray hair and had a striking resemblance to Epstein, but was it really him? And why did people have doubts about his death? Well, there have been rumors that he was a sad intelligence agent and that he was being used to compromise high-profile people in Hollywood and in the US government, as well as gather intelligence for the Israeli intelligence. So, was Epstein really compromising Hollywood elites and politicians? Turns out, Epstein did reveal this during what would be one of his last interviews. In the summer of 2018, James B. Stewart, a writer for the New York Times, found himself inside the opulent Manhattan mansion of Jeffrey Epstein. A young woman, possibly in her teens, answered the door and ushered him in. Little did he know that this encounter would reveal a web of secrets that would send shockwaves through the corridors of power. Epstein, a convicted sex offender and financier, claimed to possess a treasure trove of damaging information about the rich and famous. As Stewart delved into the conversation, he was confronted with a disturbing reality, Epstein's knowledge of the darkest secrets of the elite. Epstein's claims were nothing short of astonishing. He boasted of an extensive network of connections to the world's wealthiest and most influential individuals. But it wasn't just their names that Epstein knew. He also claimed to possess intimate details about their sex lives and drug use. Stewart, intrigued by the potential implications of Epstein's revelations, pressed him for more information. The overriding impression I took away from our roughly 90-minute conversation was that Mr. Epstein knew an astonishing number of rich, famous, and powerful people and had photos to prove it, Stewart wrote. He also claimed to know a great deal about these people, some of it potentially damaging or embarrassing, including details about their supposed sexual proclivities and recreational drug use. Epstein's connection were far-reaching, spanning across industries and continents. From politicians to business tycoons, from Hollywood celebrities to Silicon Valley moguls, Epstein seemed to have an uncanny ability to infiltrate the inner circles of power. But how did he gain access to such influential figures? And what did they confide in him? According to the journalist, Epstein suggested that his own scandalous past made it easy for others to trust him with their secrets. He claimed that people confided in him without feeling awkward or embarrassed. It was as if his checkered history created a sense of of camaraderie among the elite, a shared understanding of their own vulnerabilities. But that's not all. The billionaire used sick methods to get his way. Epstein's New York City mansion, located on the Upper East Side, was a fortress of secrets. Every room, every hallway, and every corner was meticulously monitored by hidden surveillance cameras. These cameras were strategically placed to capture every movement, every conversation, and every intimate moment of Epstein's guests. Disguised as innocent objects like clocks, lamps, and even artwork, these cameras were virtually undetectable to the untrained eye. Epstein's guests, including politicians, celebrities, and business tycoons, were unknowingly under constant surveillance, their every move recorded for his twisted purposes. The installation of these surveillance cameras was not just for security purposes. Epstein had a sinister motive to gather incriminating evidence against his powerful friends. These recordings would later become tools of manipulation and control, ensuring their loyalty and silence. While Epstein's New York City mansion was a hotbed of surveillance, it was his private island, Little St. 
James, that took the concept to a whole new level. This secluded paradise became a playground for the rich and powerful, but little did they know, their every move was being watched. Hidden among the lush foliage and pristine beaches were countless surveillance cameras, strategically positioned to capture every moment on the island. From the main residence to the guest cottages, no area was left unmonitored. Epstein's guests, including politicians, celebrities, and even members of the royal family, were unknowingly under constant surveillance. These cameras were not only discreetly placed in the interiors of the buildings, but also in outdoor areas, ensuring that no activity went unnoticed. Epstein's private island, once thought of as a sanctuary for the elite, became a stage for his twisted games of power and control. The recordings from these cameras were not just for Epstein's personal pleasure, they were part of a larger scheme, a blackmail operation designed to maintain his hold over his influential acquaintances. The footage captured on Little St. James became a tool to ensure their loyalty and silence. But how did Epstein use this surveillance system for blackmail? The answer lies in the compromising footage he obtained. Epstein meticulously catalogued and organized the footage, creating a vast library of secrets. When Epstein's powerful friends visited his properties, they were unknowingly entering a trap. Their actions, conversations, and most private moments were captured on tape, providing Epstein with a powerful tool for manipulation. The billionaire would carefully review the footage, identifying moments of vulnerability or illicit behavior. Armed with this knowledge, he would approach his friends, subtly hinting at his possession of the incriminating material. The fear of exposure and the potential consequences kept Epstein's friends trapped in a web of secrecy. They knew that their reputations, careers, and personal lives could be destroyed if the footage ever saw the light of day. Epstein's surveillance system became a powerful tool for control, ensuring the loyalty and silence of his powerful friends. The mere threat of exposure was enough to keep them compliant with his desires. Jeffrey took me into a room which is a little bit back further than this window. And it had all the computers and all these monitors, like the old fashioned TV monitors stacked. This was one of Epstein's accusers, Maria Farmer, who came forward with a chilling revelation. She claimed that Epstein hid pinhole cameras throughout his luxurious Manhattan townhouse, using them to monitor the private moments of his victims. Farmer said the surveillance system, which included tiny pinhole cameras, appeared to be monitoring the home's bedrooms and bathrooms. I looked at the cameras and I saw toilet, toilet, bed, bed, toilet, bed. Farmer revealed, I'm like, I am never gonna use the restroom here, and I'm never gonna sleep here, you know what I mean? It was very obvious that they were, like, monitoring private moments. Farmer was not the only one who was shown the room as another victim. Virginia Jufre said she saw the room as well during the two years she was under Epstein's power. I'm looking at the monitors. I'm like, that's my room. That's the massage room. That's my shower. That's my toilet. That's everyone else's toilet in the house. That's everyone else's shower in the house. Every single corner of that house was monitored. He was watching everybody all the time. This was a black blackmail scheme, all those powerful people abusing underage girls, Virginia revealed in an interview. What is more interesting is that she revealed that the same was happening at Little St. James Island. In her memoir, she described the hidden passages in the island and the secret control room that was filled with monitors. What I could see when I stole a glimpse here and there was an array of tiny screens, 20-odd or something, small screens showing various rooms of the mansion I had recognized. The images were constantly changing, so I found it hard to pinpoint an exact location, but from the core and short glimpses, I suddenly knew from then on that my feelings of my every move being watched inside his corridors was now more than a possibility, but was actually happening, she wrote. Clearly, Epstein was monitoring all his visitors' actions and had a lot of compromising evidence against them. The question on many people's minds was, was he really using the footage to blackmail elites for his personal gain, or were there greater powers at work? Well, that is where his connection to Mossad comes in. This guy has an island. On the island, he has a building that's colored in the 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 mate it's painted in the colors of the uh, uh israeli flag <laughs> they think he's a Mossad agent he's some sort of intelligence agent Epstein's island did have a building painted in blue and white, just like an Israeli flag. But was he really an intelligence officer? Well, there is a lot that connects the billionaire to Mossad, and most of it has everything to do with his then-girlfriend, Ghislaine Maxwell, the daughter of British media mogul Robert Maxwell. Ghislaine was not only Epstein's longtime associate, but also his alleged accomplice in the exploitation of underage girls. Her father, Robert Maxwell, was suspected of having ties to intelligence agencies, including the Mossad. The Foreign Office suspected that Maxwell was a secret agent 
agent of a foreign government, possibly a double agent or a triple agent, and almost certainly financed by Russia. He had known links to the British Secret Intelligence Service, MI6, to the Soviet KGB, and to the Israeli Intelligence Service, Mossad. Six serving and former heads of Israeli intelligence services attended Maxwell's funeral in Israel, while Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir eulogized him. Robert Maxwell's death is itself a mystery. The official narrative of his death was that he fell from his yacht, the Lady Ghislaine, and drowned in 1991. However, evidence from the book, The Assassination of Robert Maxwell, Israel's Super Spy, painted a different picture. The book alleges that Mossad got rid of Maxwell after he threatened to blackmail Mossad and reveal secrets. Maxwell is claimed to have asked the Israelis for money to stop his network of businesses from going under in return for his silence. His business was more than three billion pounds in debt, and he desperately needed cash. According to the book, Maxwell had been expecting to receive a payment from Mossad, and his anchored yacht was waiting to rendezvous with Israeli agents. Instead, he was murdered and dumped overboard. With the established connection between Epstein and the Mossad, it is easy to understand why he compromised his guests, and since he was finally caught and arrested, there were many people who needed Epstein alive. So, according to conspiracy theorists online, Epstein's death was faked. Jeffrey Epstein's suspicious death. Where do you think all this footage is now? Do you think it's with the FBI? Do you yeah, think it's I mean, with the CIA? Do you think it's... That is the question on everyone's mind. One thing is certain. Epstein may have had some sort of insurance to ensure that in case anyone tried to kill him, all the information that he had would go public. Therefore, everyone he was potentially involved with, from Mossad to the elites, needed him alive. However, the only way to do this was to fake his death and get him out of jail. Everything about Epstein's death is mysterious, which has led many to think that something sinister took place and that the official story was a cover-up. And as we will see, internet detectives may have uncovered the plot to sneak Epstein out of jail. When a picture of Epstein's body was pictured and the photo uploaded to social media, internet detectives were quick to notice that something was amiss. According to internet detectives, the nose of the deceased body looked nothing like that of Epstein. While Epstein's nose when he was alive was straight and pointed, the picture taken as his body was being wheeled away from jail showed a curved nose. That was not the only body part that raised eyebrows. According to internet there was also something off about his ears. They were not Epstein's. So how exactly did Epstein meet his alleged death? And what about his death made people skeptical? Well, to get the full story, it is important to delve into his long-known criminal history, as well as how he got to be in this position. In 2005, the first sexual abuse allegations against Jeffrey Epstein came to light when a 14-year-old girl bravely stepped forward to accuse him of molesting her at a Palm Beach, Florida house. This courageous act would set in motion a series of events that would eventually expose the dark underbelly of Epstein's world. According to reports, the young girl claimed that she had been brought to Epstein's mansion by a female acquaintance from Royal Palm Beach High School. In exchange for money, she was coerced into giving Epstein a massage, which quickly turned into a horrifying ordeal of sexual abuse. This initial accusation would prove to be just the tip of the iceberg as more victims would come forward in the following years, shedding light on the extent of Epstein's alleged crimes. The bravery of this young girl in speaking out against her abuser would ultimately ultimately paved the way for justice to be sought for the countless others who had suffered at Epstein's hands. Following the courageous accusation made by the 14-year-old girl in 2005, Palm Beach investigators launched a thorough investigation into the allegations against Jeffrey Epstein. Their efforts aimed to uncover the truth and bring justice to the victims. During the course of their probe, Palm Beach investigators spoke with five alleged victims and 17 witnesses, gathering crucial information about Epstein's illicit activities. These individuals provided harrowing accounts of their encounters with Epstein, shedding light on the disturbing nature of his actions. According to the investigative files, Epstein would lure the girls to his house under the pretense of receiving massages. However, these encounters quickly turned sexual, with Epstein using sex toys on the victims while he engaged in explicit acts. Some girls even reported being paid between $200 and $1,000 for these encounters, with Epstein offering them additional money to recruit other vulnerable girls into his web of exploitation. The testimonies of these victims and witnesses painted a chilling picture of Epstein's modus operandi, revealing the extent of his manipulation and abuse. Their bravery in coming forward would play a crucial role in exposing Epstein's true nature and setting the stage for further investigations into his activities. As the investigations into Jeffrey Epstein's alleged sexual abuse continued, the legal proceedings surrounding his case began to unfold. In 2006, Palm Beach prosecutors sought to have Epstein charged with unlawful sexual activity with a minor and lewd and lascivious molestation. However, the case took 
took a different turn when it was referred to a grand jury. In June 2006, the grand jury charged Epstein with one count of solicitation of prostitution based on the testimony of one of the victims. This charge, however, did not fully capture the gravity of Epstein's alleged crimes. In 2007, the FBI prepared a 53-page indictment against Epstein, which could have led to more severe charges. However, Epstein's legal team initiated plea negotiations with Alexander Acosta, who was the U.S. District Attorney for the Southern District of Florida at the time. In June 2008, Epstein pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of solicitation of prostitution and solicitation of prostitution with a minor under the age of 18. This controversial plea deal resulted in Epstein being sentenced to just 18 months in jail, during which he was allowed to leave the facility for work release for up to 12 hours a day, six days a week. The leniency of this plea deal drew widespread criticism and raised questions about the fairness of the justice system. It also sparked outrage among Epstein's victims who felt that their voices were not being heard and that justice was not being served. Following Jeffrey Epstein's release from jail in 2009, a series of significant events unfolded, shedding further light on the extent of his alleged crimes and the subsequent legal battles that ensued. In September 2009, Epstein's non-prosecution agreement, which had been kept under wraps, was made public. This revelation sent shockwaves through the public and ignited a wave of outrage. Dozens of Epstein's accusers, who claimed they were molested when they were underage, filed civil lawsuits against the financier, seeking justice for the trauma they had endured. The civil lawsuits alleged that Epstein and his girlfriend Ghislaine Maxwell operated an international sex trafficking ring, exploiting vulnerable young girls. Epstein began a lengthy process of settling the civil cases outside of court, attempting to avoid further public scrutiny. However, the allegations against him continued to mount, and the victims' voices grew louder. But in the midst of all his cases, there was one very sinister allegation that seemed to overshadow all the others. What if Epstein was not just a pedophile? What if he was doing it for someone else, and he was just the face of the operation? In 2008, Epstein pleaded guilty to charges of soliciting prostitution from a minor and was sentenced to a mere 13 months in jail, a controversially lenient punishment. It was during this time that whispers of Epstein's connections to intelligence agencies started to circulate. Some speculated that his light sentence was a result of his cooperation with intelligence agencies, specifically the Mossad. He was eventually arrested on July 6, 2019. The death of Jeffrey Epstein on August 10, 2019 sent shockwaves through the world and immediately raised suspicions. How could a man who was under high-profile scrutiny and held in a secure facility manage to take his own life? The circumstances surrounding Epstein's death became the subject of intense speculation and fueled conspiracy theories that continue to persist. The official narrative was something that would easily pass for a Hollywood script. According to the official narrative, Epstein found himself confined to his jail cell in the Special Housing Unit, SHU, of the Metropolitan Correctional Center. This unit, designed to house high-profile and at-risk inmates, was supposed to provide enhanced security and surveillance. According to official reports, Epstein's cellmate was transferred out earlier that day, leaving him alone in his cell. This, coupled with the fact that the guards on duty were overworked and understaffed, created an environment ripe for potential foul play. As the night wore on, the surveillance footage revealed a series of irregularities and lapses in protocol. The guards assigned to monitor Epstein's cell were allegedly found to be asleep or distracted, failing in their duty to ensure his safety. One of the key factors that raised eyebrows was the apparent violations of jail procedures. Epstein was supposed to be under constant surveillance, yet reports emerged that the guards on duty had failed to conduct regular checks and falsified records to cover up their negligence. This revelation only added to the suspicion that foul play may have been involved, but the story took an even darker turn when Epstein's first suicide attempt came to light. On July 25, 2019, Epstein was found semi-conscious in his prison cell with injuries to his neck. This incident raised concerns about his well-being and led to him being placed on suicide watch. As the investigations unfolded, more details emerged that added to the intrigue. It was revealed that Epstein had been taken off suicide watch just days before his death, despite a previous incident that had raised concerns about his well-being. This decision raised questions about the judgment of those responsible for his care and whether it was a deliberate move to create an opportunity for him to take his own life. Amidst all the chaos and controversy, there was one crucial piece of evidence that could have shed light on the events leading up to Epstein's first suicide attempt, the surveillance video. The footage from the jail's CCTV cameras outside Epstein's cell could have provided valuable insights into what transpired that day. But, as it turns out, this crucial evidence was not meant to see the light of day. In a shocking revelation, U.S. prosecutors disclosed that the surveillance video from Epstein's first suicide attempt was destroyed
destroyed by technical errors. The jail mistakenly saved footage from the wrong cell, resulting in the accidental erasure of the evidence that could have potentially revealed crucial details about Epstein's state of mind and the circumstances surrounding his first suicide attempt. The implications of this erasure were staggering. It raised questions about the transparency and integrity of the investigation into Epstein's death. How could such a critical piece of evidence be mishandled? Was it a genuine mistake or something more sinister at play? These are the questions that demand answers, and the public is left grappling with the unsettling reality that the truth may forever remain obscured. Adding to the intrigue were the malfunctioning cameras in the area surrounding Epstein's cell. These cameras, which should have captured crucial footage of the events leading up to his death, conveniently malfunctioned, leaving a void of visual evidence. This raised questions about whether the malfunction was a mere coincidence or a deliberate attempt to conceal the truth. The suspicious circumstances surrounding Epstein's death prompted immediate investigations by the FBI and the Department of Justice. These agencies sought to uncover the truth behind the events leading up to his demise and determine whether any foul play was involved. The focus of the investigations was not only on the guards who were on duty, but also on the broader system that allowed such lapses in security and accountability. The FBI and the Department of Justice conducted interviews, reviewed surveillance footage, and analyzed the evidence meticulously. They sought to establish a clear timeline of events and determine whether there were any individuals who may have had a motive to silence Epstein permanently. The investigations were complex and far-reaching as they delved into the web of connections Epstein had cultivated over the years. Is Epstein alive? We may never know for sure. However, the breadcrumbs of evidence may one day lead internet detectives to the real truth. If you enjoyed this video, click on the boxes playing on your screen to watch similar content.